In the 50s and 60s, I seem to remember, computers were the size of this rock. Then they became the, the size of this rock. They were used for boring things like planning nuclear strikes. And then they became used for interesting things like games and emails. You ask me, how did that happen? Because... Now, there were two things that caused the computer revolution. One was the invention of the microchip. Ta-da! The old computers had been so huge, because all their insides were full of thousands of sort of cables and valves and, and stuff, once the microchip arrived, all these valves and thingamajigs could be shrunk to the size of a peanut. Computers could now shrink, too. But what could we do with smaller computers? Well, that's where Star Trek came in. Small, easy-to-use computers were everywhere in the Enterprise. Do you see where I'm going with this? This is the town of Boulder Creek that lies above the mountains of the high-tech world of Silicon Valley in Northern California. Now, it may look like an average town, but Boulder Creek has one of the most remarkable museums in the world. To find out more, we need to speak to this man, Bruce Stammer. Now, Bruce is just an average country boy. He likes nothing more than tending his livestock, hanging out in the homestead, and dressing like Shakespeare. Now, he may have an interesting dress sense, but Bruce is one of the world's foremost experts in the history of computing. And it's not more pigs he keeps in that barn. Bruce has spent more than 10 years building a collection of computers that span the entire history of the machine's development from $20 million supercomputers through the rapid development of the personal computers we take for granted today. Reflecting the progress of the biggest beasts in today's industry, and some of the ideas that became extinct. This collection got so big that Bruce has turned his shed into a museum called the Digibarn. Hmm, so where did Bruce's love of computers come from? I'll give you one guess. That's right, back in the 60s, Star Trek was telling the world that one day, computers would be multi-purpose, everyday tools. Computed and recorded, dear with which we might all constantly interact. Computer, you will not address me in that manner. The sexy, technological innovation of the USS Enterprise had seduced the young Bruce Dammer and a generation of computer nerds. When I was a kid, my brother and I used to lie in our bed and watch Star Trek. One of the things we always noticed, and that I always noticed, was Spock, whenever there was something to really be understood, he would go on the bridge over to a console that had like a hooded screen and look in and blue light would shine on his face. Oxygen, nitrogen, atmosphere suitable for human life support. And I always wondered, what is this guy seeing on this screen? While Spock was staring into his mysterious database portal, the rest of the crew could be seen using user-friendly computers in every aspect of their lives. A revolutionary idea that would change everything. Working. So all the geeks in the 60s that were growing up saw that and said, we got to make that real in the 70s, and they did. But it wouldn't happen overnight. Star Trek may have shown early computer pioneers what the future might be, but it didn't tell them how to get there. This would take some experimentation. The first attempt came in 1974 with a whopping great blue box that is widely seen as the first ever personal computer. But it's not quite the PC we take for granted today. It came as a highly intricate build-it-yourself kit, and once you had finished soldering its circuit boards together, users would find that it didn't actually really do anything because software hadn't been invented yet. Yes, it wasn't perfect, but for thousands of would-be tech types, it was a start. And thanks to its Trek fan inventor, Ed Roberts, it had a somewhat familiar sounding name. So here we have the, the Sputnik for the nerd generation. This is the Altair 8800, named after solar system in Star Trek. And directly for Altair 6. Altair 6. I think I'm going to get spacesick. This became the focus of many homebrew and personal computer clubs. Kids trying to figure out how to make this thing useful. And a couple of those kids were Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, and their version of the Altair Useful was the Apple computer. And Bill Gates and, and his guys wrote basic 
the, the language for this thing, and they created a company called Microsoft. So the modern world came out of this unassuming blue box. And the rest is Star Trek history. Armed with their Star Trek visions and very big brains, young enthusiasts like Bill Gates took what they had learned from fiddling around with Altair and set about bringing the personal computer into all of our lives. The guys went on to found Microsoft and Apple, Silicon Valley and the PC industry completely changing the whole world, making everyone rich beyond their wildest dreams. And, and, and what thanks do I get for inspiring all this? Where's my cut? I, I don't see it in my contract. Well, actually, we did get some credit. In 2000, another one of the computer world's nerd giants, Paul Allen, one of the world's richest men, opened a science fiction museum in Seattle. Pride of the place? My old captain's chair. He bought it on eBay for a reported 100,000 bucks. And it didn't stop there. Last year, his company, which really is called Vulcan Inc., helped finance the launch of his own version of the Enterprise, Spaceship One, the first ever privately funded craft to leave Earth's atmosphere. Now, it can't quite travel at warp speeds of a thousand times faster than light, like the Enterprise, but it's pretty cool. Incredible, isn't it? Star Trek transformed the lives of us all with all its incredible new scientific and engineering concepts. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Well, can I, can I, can I go now? Oh, there's more? Uh, sorry. But where did us Star Trek guys get this technological inspiration from? Did we study for years at the feet of Einstein? Did we have some kind of special foresight into the future? Or were we all just scientific geniuses? Well, no. Uh, the truth about how Star Trek came up with all this world-changing stuff is really quite simple. We made it all up. Are you happy now? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Back at Paramount Studios in Hollywood, we had next to no idea about science or technology. We just wanted to make a cool TV show. But one thing we did know was that if we were going to make people believe in Gene Roddenberry's idea of a better future for mankind, the stuff you guys saw on the TV had to look kind of convincing. Head of Star Trek's Making It All Up department was Gene Roddenberry's right-hand woman, head scriptwriter Dorothy Fontana. Gene Roddenberry had a vision of Star Trek going places that other science fiction shows weren't going. He wanted the technology to look futuristic, not just sound futuristic. In the reality of our real world, we worked on electric typewriters. We didn't even have a really good copy machine until about halfway through the first season. We were dealing with our technology and trying to envision a world that where technology was far greater. And they envisioned some amazing things, like the most famous piece of Star Trek technology of all, the transporter. Surely this was the result of years of creative planning. Uh, not quite. In fact, like most of the stuff in the show, the transporter had been born out of necessity, deadlines, and a meager budget. The transporter was never meant to be in the beginning. We were going to have shuttlecraft, and the company in Phoenix, Arizona, making the big set plus the uh, smaller models didn't deliver on time. So there were at least six or seven episodes that uh, we would not have the shuttlecraft, and therefore we had to find a way to get on and off the ship. Faced with this dilemma, Gene Roddenberry came up with a cunning plan. I know, he said, uh, let's just sort of uh, have them just uh, appear out of kind of nowhere or something. And hey, presto, the transporter was born. From its very first episode, Star Trek had attracted attention. I sat back and waited for the fan mail, and boy, did it come. The following week, we received the first bag of mail. And then after that, it became bags of mail, more and more and more. So by the end of the, about the first 13 episodes, we were having so much mail that we could not handle it in the office. Letters, a thousand letters, a hundred thousand letters, 
a million. We were getting very intelligent letters. They weren't all just, please send me a picture. H hang on, these letters weren't for me? There were people in the science community, people in the medical community. Someone wrote into Gene Roddenberry and said, how do those sliding doors work? And the answer was there were two big stagehands pulling them on either side of the doors. Sometimes the stagehands were slow on the cue, so the actors would have to bang right into the door because you had to walk at them with authority, like they were going to open. Despite the prehistoric behind-the-scenes technology, Star Trek's on-screen vision of the future seemed to be catching on. And now we were getting mail from the world of medicine. Stunned by the bits of cardboard and balsa wood, oh, sorry, I mean amazing surgical equipment in the Enterprise sick bay of Dr. McCoy. Here was a place where diagnosis and surgery was quick and painless and didn't even require a knife. No bleeding. It's a medical miracle. And it was this idea that would help inspire a medical revolution. Real medicine was, of course, a world away from Star Trek in the 1960s and 70s. Should have responded by now. Back then, the diagnosis of many serious illnesses in the human body would often involve messy and dangerous exploratory surgery. Now, through Star Trek, the medical community was offered a tantalizing glimpse of the future. <laughs> 